Um, okay, and this session earns two CPHC CEUs. There'll also be a self-report link for that, and we'll get the code later on in the session. Um, I'm realizing I didn't introduce myself, so my name's on this slide. Uh, Lisa White, I'm the Associate Director at FIAS. Uh, I've been with FIAS for almost nine years now, and most of the time there, I've been working on technical work. So most of the time there, actually, I manage the project certification team and um, worked on standards development, which we're gonna hear about today, kind of the nitty gritty of the technical. I'll try not to be too technical because this is a 101 class. Um, let's see, I'm on the technical committee. I'm also a trainer for the CPHC, which you guys will learn about if you don't know that term yet, as well as the Woofy Passive Energy Modeling Software Training. Um, okay, so real quick, just to start off, I'm gonna talk about FIAS. In case you're brand new, what FIAS is and what our mission and vision is. Um, so we're really trying to address the climate crisis through buildings that can mitigate and adapt to climate change. So not only are we reducing carbon emissions, but we also want to create resilient structures um, for the future. So we know we need to get to 100% renewable, and we're really trying to help chart that way. And it's a passive design strategy, which I will reiterate over and over today focuses on conservation first and it's it's on the path to zero. It's it's the it's a cost optimal path to zero energy. Um, so our vision is to make high performance passive building commonplace. And we're getting there. Um, <laughs> very slowly, slowly but exponentially, I mean in, in terms of you know how long this has actually been around in the US. We've already got some chat questions and all that are coming on now. Um, I mentioned earlier, if you have uh, questions, you can put them in the chat. I think Jenny's gonna monitor that. Um, and Jenny, again, feel free to interject whenever it seems relevant, because I don't wanna get past the past someone's question if it, um, if it was relevant to the particular slide. Okay. Um, so a little more about FIAS, what do we do? We certify buildings, those are plaques in the top left. We certify products or components that go into buildings, so this is the Certified Window Data Certificate. Um, we work with creating compliance tools. So this is the Wolfie Passive software. We'll talk about all of these. Um, we certify professionals. So we've got our kind of suite of professionals down at the bottom, our CPHCs, our builders, our raters and verifiers. We set standards. So you've got the climate specific passive building standards example there. And we have a, a membership group, the FIAS Alliance, which Jenny currently runs. So we're, we're doing a lot of different angles to try to fulfill that mission. And there's lots of different passive house organizations all over the world. So it's important to point this out and you'll see some of this in the history that I'm gonna talk about. You've got the US, which I'm um, with FIAS. You've got Australia, Germany, um, Hellenic, so Greece, Japan, uh, Italy, Canada. Not all of these institutes set standards like we do, but all of them promote kind of the same passive building concepts that we're going to talk about today. And some of, you know, some are, uh, geared to different climates. We'll talk about the Passive House Institute metrics because that's kind of the roots of how we became what we are in the US. Okay, so I gave you a little bit about me and what um, our organization does. And I wanted to do a quick poll in the beginning just to get a feel for who's on the call. It helps me gear how we'll talk about things. Um, and I'm also just generally interested who's here. So Jenny, if you could launch that, that'd be awesome. We'll give you guys a minute to get that going. And also those just coming on, feel free to share your video. It helps, I'll check on you guys over here every once in a while, it helps to see like head nods or, you know, totally confused faces. Um, it's not, you know, quite as easy to talk to a screen for two hours as it is faces. Whenever you think it's, yeah, go ahead, Jenny. So I see a majority, so we'll give it another maybe 10 seconds. So get your votes in. All right, 
poll is closing. Awesome. So I'm not sure I'm going to be able to see the results. So you might have to share this, Jenny. Sorry. It's not, it's not letting me do this. Can you see the uh, results? I think our uh, participant can, participants can see the results. Okay. Hmm. How do I share these with you, Lisa? <laughs> it's okay. If you just, you want to just talk through what the results are? Sure. I see the majority of 50% of um, participants coming from the Northeast, followed closely okay. by the Midwest with 25%. I know that's not statistically close, but it feels close because that's where we are located. Um, then the Northwest, a few from the Southeast and Southwest. We have a few Canadians and a few outside of Canada joining us as well. Um, awesome. I see a majority, 33% uh, of us are architects, which is not me. Um, some builders, engineers, uh, developers, some students, some curious homeowners, um, a few builders, and then how much do you know about passive house, passive building? About 8% are brand new to the topic. Awesome. 58% uh, under, somewhat understand the concepts and metrics. Heard of the concept, there are a few people who've heard of the concept, but not the details. Oh, we have a few passive house professionals or equivalent. Welcome. Mm -hmm. um, and then a small percentage of extensive experience and experts. All right. I was hoping for everyone in the one, two, three range for the 101. So the experts, bear with me. It's a 101 class. So you might already know all of this. <laughs> Just a heads up. OK, great. That's super helpful for me. And welcome, everyone. So I'm going to dive in now with the agenda. Okay, so I'm really going to start with the basics. So passive building principles, what are the metrics that surround um, defining a passive building or passive building certification and what's the history surrounding that as well. And that history kind of dovetails into the development of the certification standards. So what are those metrics, what are the standards and how are they developed, what's kind of the rationale. And then I saw in the chat someone wants to talk about project certification, we will be talking about that. So we'll understand the standards behind the project certification and then understand what that process is and who's involved. So building your team, what professionals need to be involved. And then we'll look at some common design features in passive buildings. And I'm thinking we'll have plenty of time that we'll get to choose one other segment, our own adventure. And what that is, we'll take one more poll. So Jenny, after that is when the other poll is, if there's time, um, we'll, we'll pick what we talk about. Maybe we'll get ahead on a lot of those. Kind of depends on how many questions you all have throughout the process. That's not to discourage questions at all. I, I highly encourage them. I, these are kind of the main um, pieces I want people to understand leaving this. And all of the other stuff we talk about, I can point you guys to resources related to those. So, okay. So principles, metrics, and history. So when I was first introduced to a passive building many years ago, this is the first image I saw. So on the left, the solo cup, you can think of that as code compliant. And on the right, you can think of passive building. They're both kind of serving the same purpose, right? They're holding a liquid of some sort. Um, the thermos is essentially designed with more upfront thoughtfulness. Um, it's going to keep something warm, warm, keep something cold, cold, keep um, particles, bugs out. You know, it's gonna keep the product inside the building clean and maintain temperature, which is essentially what the passive building is doing. It's maintaining healthy indoor air quality as well as the temperature inside the building. So from a, if you come away with nothing, at least maybe this image, <laughs> you'll be able to remember this. Okay, so we're gonna just start through this, the passive building principles and we're gonna talk through these first kind of basic principles. Um, so the, Passive buildings are really defined by control strategies. And then you use these principles um, or these strategies to um, achieve them. So we want thermal control. So what that means is continuous insulation around the building, um, avoiding thermal bridging or minimizing thermal bridging, which is, um, we'll go deeper into that later. And then we think about radiation control. So the sun's radiation. And this is about optimizing windows and solar gains. So I wanna be really clear up front that Passive building is not the same as passive solar. We'll see some of that in the history briefly, but it's not about um, mass and glass. It's not about a ton of solar gain. 
It's not about all south windows. It's absolutely not about that. It's about balancing solar gain, getting it when you want it and blocking it when you don't in a balance of, of, um, of solar gain around the building. So we, we don't want to design with all south glass, even though that can really drop our heating load, it can lead to overheating. And those are some, some issues we saw with early passive buildings in, in the US. And then we turn to air control. And this is achieved through airtight construction. So air sealing all around the building, testing it, making sure that that air control layer is, um, is solid. And then because we seal everything up so tight, we then use balanced ventilation with heat recovery. So this is almost the lungs of the building where we're um, sealing up all holes in the building, cracks, everything, and then placing intentional openings in the building enclosure to provide fresh air and exhaust stale air at the same rate so it's balanced um, with filtration on the fresh air coming in. So we seal it all up and then we, we take this nice device that provides fresh air and removes uh, stale air. And kind of as a result of those control strategies, we reduce peak loads in buildings. So we have minimized mechanical systems. We don't need as much heating and cooling as a result. And that are, this is really what passive building can do. So we can get a little bit deeper. We're not gonna to get too deep into it today, but there's also more dynamics to it. And I think you'll see some of this if you do register for the mechanical summit. Um, so these top strategies here, uh, the radiation control, the shading, daylighting, that's kind of optimizing solar and gain, enthalpy recovery ventilation, we just talked to balance ventilation, recovering heat and moisture, air tightness, thermal bridge elimination, which again is the enclosure, and then the high performance insulation. That's kind of covering those top five, the radiation, air, and thermal control. There's also moisture control, which I'll talk about a little bit in terms of looking at the enclosure from a hydrothermal perspective. So how does heat and moisture move through the enclosure? Um, there's controlling air humidity, really big challenge in passive buildings with low sensible loads. Um, the dynamics of HVAC with different, um, different loads in different spaces and maybe hydrothermal storage. What's your building envelope store in terms of moisture? Um, so we won't really look at the bottom half of this, but um, I want you to be aware of these other concepts um, surrounding passive buildings. Okay, so to look a little bit deeper into each of these, um, continuous insulation is really just like, um, adding a continuous thermal layer around your building. How thick that is depends on your climate. Um, it's not always add the, a big sweater on your building. It totally is climate specific. Um, and it's minimizing thermal bridging. So a thermal bridge is the basically a piece of conductive material that travels from the inside to the outside of the building, or it's more conductive than the um, material surrounding it. And the best way I can conceptualize a thermal bridge is a sleeping bag. So if you're camping on a cold night and you're in a sleeping bag and you, you hit that zipper, that's a thermal bridge and you can feel it, right? So the cold is coming in through. You have this nice, wonderful insulated sleeping bag and the, the zipper is a thermal bridge. So we're trying to eliminate that. So optimizing windows and solar gain, kind of got a little deeper into this one earlier, but it's, it's not just about the solar gain, but it's also about optimizing window thermal performance. So increase, or sorry, decreasing the U value of windows. So I should maybe take a step back. R value is thermal transmittance. Um, and the higher the R value, the less thermal transmittance. And then U value is conductivity. So the lower the U value, the less thermal transmittance. So they're inverse of each other. So a lower U value window performs better than a higher but a higher R value wall performs better than a lower. So we mostly just talk about U values with windows, R values with, um, with opaque assemblies. Okay, so you're looking at often triple pane or double pane windows in passive buildings. Um, and this graphic shows um, infrared imaging of this uh, retrofitted project where essentially windows are usually the weakest link in the building enclosure. And it's showing that, um, it's basically showing that the most heat or the, the windows are the warmest because it can see the heat from the inside um, coming through that window on the left. And then they retrofitted and it's reducing the heat transmission. So the window staying colder on the outside and the, the regular opaque enclosure is also staying colder on the outside. And that right image is the goal. That's the goal of the passive building. Okay, airtight construction, we'll get into this exact metric, but it's, it's tight and it's five times lower than the IECC 2018 target. 
Um, it must be tested on site with blower door testing. So it is a, it is a pass fail number and we'll get a little deeper into that. Balance ventilation with heat recovery. Again, we seal up the envelope and then we intentionally place openings to bring in fresh air to living spaces and exhaust stale air from kitchens and bathrooms. And this provides superior indoor air quality. And the uh, kind of graphic you see on the right here is showing how the heat recovery works. Um, so basically you're taking, let's say it's 70 degrees inside and it's zero outside in the middle of a Chicago winter or something. You're, you're um, exhausting that 70 degree air and you're bringing in that zero degree air. And what you're trying to do is take that zero degree air and bring it up closer to the interior temperature. Um, so you're hopefully bringing it up to 60, 65 by taking the heat from the 70 degree air pocket and transferring it to the incoming air. And that's what this graphic is showing on the right. Um, the fresh air is coming in cold, the exhaust air is leaving warm, and it's mixing. Well, it's not mixing, I'm sorry. It's passing over heat transfer um, plates or um, some other material if it's transferring moisture. And it's basically, you're just trying to maintain the interior air temperature. So it's reducing the space conditioning load um, in, in the space, whether that's heating or cooling. And again, this is, this is controlled ventilation versus random ventilation. Um, so we're placing intentional openings, supplying, exhausting, doing this in a balanced way, um, rather than most buildings, which um, might just pressurize the building or bring in outdoor air, and then it kind of goes out through cracks and leaks or um, comes in through cracks and leaks from your basement, depending on pressure differences around the building. So we're getting fresh air that's coming in through filtration rather than coming in through whoever knows what your wall is made of or dust and you know gross areas like your crawl space. Um, so this is really um, important that the ventilation really does improve indoor air quality. So we're using the heat and moisture recovery to reduce the space conditioning loads, but we're um, by providing the fresh air, we're improving the indoor air quality. So kind of the hierarchy of steps to do this is source control. So just be careful with what you put in your building. Um, the second is the ventilation that, that I just talked about, bring in fresh air, exhaust the stale air, and then use filtration. So this is kind of the hierarchy. So filtration would mean put filters on the recirculated air inside of your house, as well as, well as the fresh air coming in through that ERV or HRV. And then again, as a result of this, um, you have minimized efficient mechanical systems. Um, the minimized is, means both a lower load, but also less complex. Uh, so we're seeing cases where, okay, we have better windows, right? So we're not gonna have necessarily that cold spot under the window. So we don't have to bring our, if we have a ducted heating and cooling system, we don't have to bring that all the way out to the window like a typical design. We can dump that somewhere else in the space and it mixes better with the space because the temperature of your, your total building enclosure is closer to equal all around. So you don't have these kind of spots, um, trouble spots, I guess that you'd have to take care of that require a lot of duct work <clears throat> and a lot of like specific um, layouts. Okay, so getting into the metro, or maybe I pause, are there any questions at this point? No questions yet. Awesome. Um, okay, so getting into the metrics surrounding passive building uh, standards. So the first and kind of the heart of passive building is, is related to the space conditioning. So there are annual demand limits and peak load limits. So an annual demand is how much heating or cooling you must deliver to the space in order to maintain a desired set point. This is completely irregardless of the system delivering the heating or cooling. It's just how much must you deliver to the space, for example, to keep the space 70 degrees year round. And that number is dependent on those passive building strategies, how far you've gone with uh, the enclosure, the air tightness and the, the ventilation rates. And then the peak load is how much you must deliver to the space at a peak condition. And again, irregardless of the equipment that's serving it, there's a certain peak on the space and that's dominated by the passive measures. And this determines the size of the mechanical system. And focus on the units here too. Um, KBTU per year is an annual demand, annual per year, it's over time and a peak load BTU per hour. So it's kind of at an instant. 
So it's, there's a difference between energy and power over time versus at a, at a specific point in time. Okay, and then there's source energy. So we had space conditioning, source energy is kind of the second pillar here. And this is how we measure our overall impact. So source energy is essentially just site energy, which is what your utility bill is, multiplied by a source energy con conversion factor based on fuel type. So we basically weight natural gas different than electricity because the overall impact of those two fuels is different at the source. So there's a metric um, per, per person for residential and per square foot for non-residential. And I'll get all into this. I'm just introducing the high level, um, the high level metrics and concepts here. And then there's an air, tight lim air tightness limit. Now again, it has to be tested, so we need a limit. Uh, FIAS uses a limit per square foot of envelope area. You could also see air tightness limits in ACH 50 or air changes per hour. So these are the high level kind of performance pillars of passive building standard. <clears throat> and just a uh, graphic here to kind of represent annual demand versus peak load. This is a building's heating and cooling load profile over the course of the year. Uh, this is KBT per hour. The top is the peak and the area under the curve with the red is the demand, the heating demand. The area under the curve with the blue is the cooling demand. So you use a certain amount over time and you use a certain amount at your peak. And we're trying to set targets for both. Okay, so a bit into the history. Um, so we're gonna take this back to the 70s. Um, in the mid 70s, amongst the oil embargo, um, the first kind of experimental locale homes were happening in central Illinois. Um, so that was happening with the Building Research Council in central Illinois. And, and then a little bit later in the 70s slash 80s, the first energy reduction methods were published and established in Canada and the US. Um, very heating dominated bias. And they were basically, I'll show some slides, but they're basically showing some strategies to reduce the total heating load in the building. And like, we know you can do these things and reduce the heating load. In the mid 90s, um, the Passive House Institute in Germany took these methods and quantified them. They said, okay, we can go so far and these are the numerical targets you would hit or that they set numerical targets around these metrics, which are super critical to um, kind of where we came from that. So then in the early 2000s, the first project outside of the Europe applied the Passive House Institute targets from Germany to their house. This is from um, our executive director, Katrin Klingenberg, took the German Passive House metrics that were set and applied that to build a house in, oddly enough, Urbana, Illinois. No uh, connection to the 70s, just total coincidence that the, this first work was actually done in Urbana, Illinois in the 70s. And then based on what we learned from that, we essentially created um, cost and climate optimized standards for North America. So there were some lessons learned, I'll get into that, get into this in a little more detail in the next slides, um, but some lessons learned and we created cost and optimized cost and climate optimized for North America. Understanding the North American climate zones are very different than Germany. And then in 2018 and 2021, we continue to develop these standards. Um, and we now we've included um, so building size and occupant density in, in the way we define our standards. Okay, so just some fun slides here with uh, some screenshots from a book from the 80s. So this is a super insulation book uh, and they're essentially showing the concepts I showed in the beginning. It's really pretty interesting over here on the right showing that um, they're like, okay, 60s, we had single pane and R11. In 80, we'll do double, triple pane, triple pane. And then they think in 19 something, we're going to be up to triple or quadruple pane. And here we are in 2020, barely at double pane. Um, but they're, you know, they're showing there's going to be a progression of increasing these over time because they understood this kind of equation of you can spend more upfront, right? And you can save more. And there's a certain, there's a certain amount you should spend upfront to save more over time. And they understood these concepts. Um, and these concepts were published and clear. Um, there's internal gains, solar gains, and backup heating, much smaller than normal brings you comfort. So it was all about reducing a heating load, spending less on your utility bill, saving oil, saving you know resources. Um, and they even talked about vapor barriers for moisture control, air to air heat exchangers. And it's the same kind of concepts um, that were brought forward today or that we're talking about today. And they're showing you here on this bottom right, 
the, um, the base house with the higher kind of loads in uh, January and December, and you can reduce those, right? There's the shift to lower in this um, super insulated building. And we're trying to do the same thing here. Um, we're just, you know, we put metrics around it so it's measurable and quantifiable. So really what they came up with is like, okay, you can apply these principles and get an 80 to 90% reduction in your demand. So how much you spend on heating and cooling, mostly heating um, over the course of the year. And then you can also reduce your peak load uh, quite a bit. Again, this is in the North America in the 70s and 80s. <clears throat> and then in the 90s, early 90s, again, the Passive House Institute in Germany took these concepts and they did something really important. They quantified them. They said, okay, there is a certain amount you should invest in passive measures. And the original concept in Germany came from um, basically the ability to deliver heat through supplier, th through the uh, fresh air ventilation. Um, so we talked about how we air seal and then we deliver balanced ventilation. So there are certain rates that you deliver in the ventilation and you can heat air up a certain amount. So it's like, okay, if we know we're gonna deliver this much air and we can heat it up this much, that sets our heating load. And what that did um, in terms of investment is if you chart kind of from the, the right to the left here, um, you continue to invest in energy the amount you pay over time goes down. And there's a certain point where you can cut out the separate heating system. So like, okay, I already have this fresh air ventilation system, but I also have my hydron hydronic heating system. So at a certain point, if I get my load in the space low enough, I can not have that hydronic heating system at all, just deliver the fresh air through the ventilation. And that that's that sharp drop you see right here. And this set that target. So this is the, um, again, the history of the PHI, the German passive house criteria. Um, so the peak load uh, for heating was set based on heating deliverable through supply air. And that came out at 10 watts per meter squared, roughly one watt per foot squared. And then they, um, so this is that peak on that chart. And then the area under the graph, the annual demand was set based on if you design to meet this peak load in Germany, what would that, um, how much energy, or sorry, how much heating would you have to deliver to that space over the course of the year um, if you met that peak? And for a Central European climate, that turned out to be around 15 kilowatt hours per meter squared per year. So that was directly related to that climate. Um, the cooling targets was not a problem in Germany, so they were just set to match the heating targets. Yeah, source energy was set essentially based on concepts around the 2000 Watt Society. I don't know a lot of detail on that. And then um, there was an air tightness limit set, a volume metric, so air changes per hour limit set. Um, and then studies showed that um, when you met that 10 watts per meter squared peak heating load, it resulted in various annual heating demands for different climates. So remember the peak heating load was set by how much heat you could deliver through the fresh air ventilation system. And then if you design to that load, you would use a, certain, a different amount of heating over the course of the year. And that's kind of what this chart shows. So this red line down here is that where they set the annual demand at 15, but you can see based on the outdoor temperature that the annual demand might be all the way down at close to zero, or it might be up to close to 35, depending on what the average annual temperature is, right? So somewhere in Chicago, Alaska versus Florida, you design to that 10 watts per meter squared, you're gonna get a different number for annual demand. So that 10 watts per meter squared and 15 kilowatt meter, kilowatt hours per meter squared is a relationship that holds true in Germany or in Central European climate, but not everywhere. So this is essentially why we developed the climate specific passive building standards. So we started this work in 2015 and formally uh, published it in, no, sorry, we started this work in 2012 and formally published it in 2015. It was a a grant funded by Building America and the Department of Energy, and we are partners with Building Science Corporation. And essentially we set out to set varying space conditioning targets for all of the climates in North America. Or at least we started with the US and now we've expanded more into uh, Canada. And for those reasons that we just talked about. So varying climates result in varying optimal investment and in conservation, and that results in varying heating, cooling loads and demands. So the first relationship again that we saw between peak and annual was 
for Central European climate and bringing those concepts to the US. We saw a lot of cases where there'd be a lot of South glass to try to meet that annual heating demand target that was again set for Germany because the peak heating load target was too hard to meet and you only had to meet one or the other. So if you added more South glass, you could meet that annual heating demand target. And now um, we saw a lot of issues with overheating if you apply the German metric in the United States. It's just the way it is because it's a different climate. There's more available solar radiation and it's just a different relationship between um, peak and annual. And yeah, so you see different, different climates around the US might have different heating and cooling load profiles like this, whereas Germany just didn't have this much variability, right? Okay, I will pause there. Yeah. Quick question, it's for me, but when you say South Glass, you mean solar panels or do you mean- Oh, no, 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 thank you. South Glass means just putting a lot of um, transparent windows, windows, sorry, I say glass, um, big windows on the South, which is if you look up passive building or passive solar, that's that's what it is. I mean, that's what people did. Um, and those types of projects find that there's often localized overheating because people are trying to reduce their heating demand so much by putting or basically taking advantage of south gain, but it or southern southern gain. Um, but that's not all there is to it. That's why there's a cooling limit, and that's why we set limits on both heating and cooling. So you can't just drive heating down without also focusing on cooling. And there is kind of an optimal point um, or an optimal balance between the two. Any other? I have a question for you. Yeah, I don't know who's talking about My name's Warren. I joined you um, like two minutes after three. So I didn't know if you had any instructions on how to ask questions, but- This on that, is fine. Thank you. On that um, previous slide, the what are these four climate zones? Can you tell us that? I, these are just representations, but I could give you guesses. Um, so this would maybe be Washington, DC something with a relatively similar heating and cooling loads and um, doesn't have heating and cooling all year, some swing seasons in the middle. This is maybe something like Portland, Oregon in the top right. You've got some cooling, you've got some heating, but not a ton of either. It's kind of a moderate temperature all year round. Um, the bottom left, maybe Austin, Texas, something really warm, has a moderate amount of heating, but mostly it's cooling and cooling load higher than heating. And then the bottom right, let's say Chicago, um, really big heating loads because it gets really cold here, but also a decent amount of cooling. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Okay, so yeah, 2021 standards and the development of these standards is what I'm gonna get into next. So the main certification requirements now that surround these, um, principles and this history are space conditioning targets, air tightness, quality assurance and on-site testing slash inspection, and then net source energy. So the way FIAS's framework works, um, the top three remain the same, no matter uh, what tier you're using for certification. We have two levels, core and zero, which I'll talk about. And the only thing that varies between those is the net source energy target or kind of that overall impact. It depends how far you go um, kind of on the path to zero. So I'm gonna talk about each of these requirements and how, what they are and how they were derived. Um, and then after this, we'll get into the actual building certification program. Okay, so the space conditioning targets. So we talked about these principles, right? These passive building principles. The question we had to answer with setting these targets is how low and can you should go with these passive measures? We know we can continue to add insulation to a building and save energy. We can get better windows, right? We can, um, we can get a higher recovery efficiency on our ventilation equipment. We can continue to save energy, but we know there's upfront costs associated with it. So how low should you go? And that's what we set out to, to answer. So um, these space conditioning targets were set with a, a cost optimization. And what I mean by that is we were optimizing for saving the most source energy for the least amount of cost. So again, you continue to invest in upgrades and that lowers your energy bill. So it lowers your total operational cost. Um, 
and saves you energy, but again, there's a sweet spot. So the total cost, actually, maybe back up here, the factors that are involved are climate, building size, occupant density, and dwelling unit density. So we, we play with a lot of things. Here's some of the study buildings on the bottom, um, all the way down to a tiny home in the far uh, left corner, some single family examples, multifamily examples up to a 10 story high rise. So building size factors into your targets, climate does. And then we played with different densities in these buildings too, because internal loads factor into these, these targets as well. Um, so this is a, a standard plot from that optimization. And the y-axis is the cost. And the cost is a combination of operational cost and upfront investment financed over time. So we're looking at your cost per year, annualized cost. And we're looking at how much um, energy savings you can get. What is the most energy savings you can get? Source energy savings on the x-axis for the lowest amount of cost on the y-axis. Um, so the way this optimization worked is it, it chose different upgrade packages. It continued to upgrade the walls, the roof, the window, the ventilation equipment. Um, it actually had the ability to slash the air tightness in half, like go twice as, twice as tight. Um, and all these black dots are uh, outputs from a single simulation, one single package that was upgraded. And this kind of black line on the bottom is what we call the optimum path, where you're saving the most for the least amount of cost. So if I wanted to save 30%-ish, um, I would pick this bottom package because it cost me least of anything at the 30%. But what we did is we didn't stop there. We said, okay, you can continue to invest in over time, um, or sorry, over more investments, you're, you, you're actually spending less over time because of reduced operational costs. So what we did is we picked the bottom point on this curve, around 44% source energy savings because it's the lowest cost point. And what um, in this optimization, we constrained uh, windows based on comfort, and I will show you that later. Um, but basically a taller window has to have a tighter U value. This is just based on comfort. We set the air tightness target to the FIAS target. So we didn't let it choose air tightness. We set the FIAS target or half of that if we wanted to get tighter. And we ignored the cost of renewables because the cost of renewables is not part of the equation when you're just looking at conservation in the building. There's a sweet spot irregardless of renewable energy to invest in passive measures. Um, so a couple examples of this. Um, okay, so just to kind of show you actually, maybe think about it this way that um, sometimes there's a, a standard or an organization that sets out to um, say, beat it by 50%, beat your baseline by 50%. And I want to show you that passive measures don't always give you the same, like, it doesn't always say 50%. It doesn't always say 90%. It totally depends on your building typology and your location. Um, so this is a single family optimization in Iowa. Um, so climate zone 5A, similar to Chicago. And you can see that um, basically what it was able to save on are those big red areas, which is heating. It cut down heating a lot, maybe it, you know, uh, save some other equipment energy, cooling. Um, didn't didn't do much except for cut down on that heating as well as hot water. Got more hot, efficient hot water. And then you look at uh, a slightly larger in Chicago, but with oh sorry, this is the same. It's the same one, or it's very similar, similar building. Um, it did about about the same thing here. And in terms of source energy savings, with this small building in this climate zone, we were about we were able to get about 60% source energy savings. Um, so pretty far, right? And that's because there's a lot of heating energy. There's a lot of potential for savings. A lot of space conditioning energy means a lot of potential for savings. Um, if you get into something in more of a mild climate, zone 3A in Oklahoma, larger building, so it's less envelope dominated. The larger building you get, the less envelope dominated it is. The less, the less passive building uh, measures help. This building was only able to save about 35% on source energy relative to the baseline. And again, most of it's in heating. Um, get into a high rise in that Iowa, that climate zone 5A again, this got to about 37% um, uh, savings. So it's not all like you saw the 60% with the single family, you're seeing 30s to 40 for um, high rise. And then you get to Hawaii, there's no heating. So what can we do? Um, so mostly um, same high rise in Hawaii, you got to also 35% savings, but most of that came from better mechanical equipment. Um, you can do some things related to air sealing um, and the balanced ventilation with the, with the heat recovery, which again, tries to maintain the interior temperature 
whether that's lower or higher than outside, it doesn't matter. It tries to maintain that interior temperature. Um, you can apply those, but you it doesn't get you quite as far because there's not as much that you can do with passive measures in, in every climate. So it's important to understand that like passive measures can do what they can do, but it's not the same. It's not universal. They're not all going to get you 50% savings. Um, it depends on what potential there is for savings. Okay, and what, what these optimizations did is we looked at that sweet spot and looked at the annual demands and peak loads and kind of extrapolated that for all building sizes across North America, sorry, all building sizes and climates across the country and all different densities and set, the, set these targets, annual demands and peak loads. And you must meet all four. So we set targets for heating, cooling on an annual basis and uh, heating and cooling on a peak basis. So they kind of do different things for you. Annual demands save you energy and operating cost, which is what we did the optimization based on. And peak loads ensure comfort, resilience, and reduce mechanical system size. So that also saves, saves cost. Um, I kind of already got to this, but basically these cannot be achieved um, with anything except the passive conservation strategies that I showed on that first slide. You cannot get more efficient equipment to meet these targets. Um, and annual demand is not the same as the amount of, uh, as, as an annual site energy. So annual demand is not what will show up on your utility bill. It's like, that's what you must deliver to the space. And then the equipment that you choose depends on how much you, energy you actually use to meet that demand. So there's a difference there. Okay, so a couple more building profiles here. Um, this is kind of your typical building profile. Now we're looking at an energy instead of the annual demands including everything. So you got heating, cooling, light, appliances, hot water, plugs, everything. Um, so you kind of have like a base load. There might be some fluctuation throughout the year, but in general, this is what it looks like. Um, and you have the higher uh, peak heating, lower cooling. Is, again, this might be Chicago. Um, the energy is the area under the curve and then the power kind of instant uh, power, instantaneous power at any given point is the, is the point at the top of the curve. And this is what passive building strategies are trying to do. We can reduce the base load a little bit. We can get better, um, you know, better equipment. But what we're really trying to do is reduce those peaks, reduce the heating and cooling um, peaks or heating and cooling energy. And that's what passive building strategies are good at. So if you were to go to certify a building, in order to get your targets for your specific project, you would go to our online criteria calculator. So this is available on our website. And um, basically the space conditioning targets based on that optimization, vary based on climate, which also includes electricity costs. So electricity costs per state is built into this calculator because the amount you'd pay for electricity depends on how much you conserve, right? Um, depends on building size and also dwelling and occupant unit density, which basically are a, a proxy for internal gains in the space. And then it spits out those four numbers, annual heat demand, cooling demand, heat and load and cooling load. <clears throat> Okay, so the, the space conditioning targets are the main thing that um, are kind of the focus of the FIA standard. This is the kind of the unique thing about passive building and the passive building standards is this mandatory requirement to reduce your loads on an annual and peak basis to these certain numbers. So that, that's really the heart of the passive building standard. All of these other things are super important, but you'll see a lot of them, are, they're, not, they're not completely related to passive passive building practices, except air tightness, which is. Um, so air tightness, just from a high level view, um, kind of talked about in the beginning, but it's an allowable building air leakage limit. Uh, and you have to test this. You have to test, you have to pressurize the building and depressurize the building. And you get to choose basically which pressure you'd like to do that to, either 50 or 75 pascals. And the um, kind of the units here, just for those unfamiliar, CFM, means cubic feet per minute. And then that little subscript is the pressure that you tested to. So this is at 50 pascals, this is at 75 pascals under it. And then uh, ACH is air changes per hour or the whole volume of the building, one, one of those per hour. Um, and then you could do that at 50 or 75 pascals. So FIAS's limit for air tightness is based on CFM 50 per square foot of envelope area. Whereas um, for example, the Passivos Institute in Germany uses ACH50 codes, a lot of codes, at least for smaller residential buildings use ACH50. Um, but we actually look at uh, per square, to, 
square foot of enclosure area. And the reason is that this target is set based on um, building durability. So Lisa, I interrupt you before we get too far from the calculator. I have a question. Um, yes. Does the calculator take into consideration the CO2E of type en of energy generation? Uh, good question. Um, let's go back to it. So they're asking what the CO2 equivalent of the energy generation, that comes into play in the source energy criteria down here, kind of. Um, we measure it. It doesn't necessarily come into account in the target, but it does come into account when you're uh, basically when you're accounting for it or when you're, um, yeah, when you're, how you're accounting for it. We don't use CO2 equivalent, we use source, which I'll talk a little bit more about, but it's a similar concept. concept. We're trying to, source is basically a proxy for looking at the associated emissions with it. <clears throat> Hope that answers Thank you. question. Mm -hmm. so, can I ask you a question? So that just, yep. that seems to be the carbon footprint that you're aiming at with that number? Yeah, pretty much. It's the overall impact number. Yeah. You could, I mean, you can take energy and convert to carbon if you want. You can take it and convert to source energy. Um, but yeah, we're, we're taking site energy and converting it to source energy. But yeah, that's, that's basically what it is. Okay, so the air tightness, the uh, target for FIAS is per square foot of enclosure area. And again, that's because the target was set based on an acceptable level of air tightness based on building durability. Um, so there was a study done by our technical committee that basically looked at the impact of air traveling through a building enclosure and what amount was acceptable um, that didn't make the building enclosure vulnerable to significant mold or rot. Um, so air carries moisture with it, a lot of moisture with it, and that's what makes the, the building enclosure vulnerable over time. Um, so essentially these numbers, air tightness does save energy, but these numbers aren't based on energy. They're not based on optimization. They're just based on building durability. So they're the same in all climates because even though air tightness saves more in Chicago than Austin, Texas, for example, it doesn't matter. It's about um, quality construction and building durability. So we have a requirement for at 50 Pascals 0.06 CFM 50 per square foot of envelope area and 0.08 at 75 Pascals. So that's just kind of, as you test at a higher pressure, there's a higher limit. And then for buildings that are taller and made of non-combustible construction, meaning they don't have wood essentially or materials that are vulnerable to, as vulnerable to mold and rot, you have a slightly higher limit because again, it's based on durability and not energy. Um, air tightness can be a great measure to, to actually aim below this to save energy, to reduce your peak load, but you don't have to. This is just kind of the pass-fail pass fail threshold. Um, quick step again, I have a question from Drew about um, adjusting numbers for building volume, for example, buildings with taller ceilings. And I think that relates to the calculator. Drew, if you wanna clarify your question, you can unmute. I guess I was seeing the square foot in the calculation, but I see it's square foot of envelope area. So I guess it's been answered. For, yeah, for air tightness, it's per square foot of envelope. But if you were talking about these targets, space conditioning criteria targets, that's per square foot of floor area. So okay, so that I'm assuming, is there an adjustment if you have taller ceilings, like 10 foot ceilings or no? There's not. Um, Basically, this, this would just tell you you need to conserve elsewhere or push a little bit harder because it's an inefficient use of the floor area. Or if you have double height spaces, it's a little bit harder to meet these targets because you don't have that floor area to divide by, right? Of, or sorry, open to below spaces. <clears throat> okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. So just forces a little, a little further in the conservation measures. Okay. Time check. Okay, we're like almost halfway. That's fine. I have no idea what slide number I'm on, but that's fine. Um, okay, so <laughs> the third uh, kind of main certification requirement is quality assurance and on site testing and inspection. I'm sorry. 
Um, so kind of the question being asked here, what are the other quality related items that are valuable, but don't show up in the energy model? So all the stuff before, um, except for air tightness, we're looking at like kilowatt hours and we're looking at cost and we're looking at energy. And that's a lot of what passive building is, but there's also a lot of quality related things that aren't going to show up as a KBTU savings or as a kilowatt hour, but they're super, super important to a quality building. Um, so for residential buildings, um, the FIAS program is built on recognized systems like Zero Energy Ready Home, Energy Star, EPA Indoor Plus, and ResNet. Um, and these make sure that you are, that you have all these quality, so it's a bunch of quality checks along the way related to moisture control or, um, you know, using best practices for uh, um, appliances, things like that, or equipment. Uh, it's a third party inspection process that we use to verify these. So we have raters and verifiers. Um, I'll get into that a little bit more later, but rater is small building and verifier is larger or commercial buildings. And these professionals go out to the site multiple times during construction. They test for the, they test the air tightness using blower door testing. They test the ventilation system uh, for both balance ventilation and to um, test the um, fan power of the equipment. And then they also look at the insulation and make sure that uh, make sure that it's installed in the quality way or a good way. Make sure there's gaps filled. Um, make sure it's basically to make sure there's not significant thermal bridging or unintended thermal bridging. So they also use infrared imaging for that. And this is really really critical for success. This is kind of like insurance for your building to make sure that what you actually designed is what you actually got. So we're trying to true up what was designed with what's built. And all the time there are things caught by these third party um, inspectors that like would really um, be significant to the building performance if they weren't altered or um, caught during this process. So this is really how you ensure um, the performance of the building. So you can model anything, but if how, you know, you have to make sure it's actually built to meet that. Yeah. And then if you were to look at this relative to the other programs, uh, this is the DOE's high performance staircase. So it's kind of like just building on code. Um, you've got Energy Star, Zero Energy Ready Home, and then FIAS Plus and FIAS Source Zero. Um, so we just push above that, but we build on everything below it because it's super important. Like for example, we don't have a lot of, um, like we lean on a lot of water management principles from Energy Star. We don't have to reinvent that wheel, right? Um, we lean on a lot of air quality or material uh, requirements from EPA and R plus. Um, so the, there's already these great existing programs out there that cover all of these things. And we add just a little bit more to it from a FIAS perspective and also try to reduce the energy use um, from those space conditioning and source energy targets, which we'll talk about and the air tightness. So we just kind of build on that and add, add to it as a natural progression. Okay, so other requirements, again, that don't show up in kilowatt hours, we've got window comfort, and then also limiting risk of condensation on windows. So this is all about the window uh, U value or the window thermal performance. So we've got the Sandy calculator where you pick out your location online, and then the height of your window over here, and it tells you the U value that's required. And that's also, this is a really good starting point for your climate too, or for your building. If you don't know where to start with your windows, just go here and start with the maximum one that's allowed. And then you might have to chart down from that to meet the requirements, but this is a really, really a pretty decent starting point. Um, and then we have moisture control and assemblies and moisture control at unav unavoidable thermal bridging. So this is about the opaque assemblies. So the first is to look at the vapor profile of the building. Um, the image below shows the perfect wall from the Building Science Corporation. If you can follow this, follow it. So it's essentially structure to the inside control, which is thermal control, air control, vapor control to the outside, and then cladding. Um, and this kind of system holds true in all climates. Um, so if you can follow this type of uh, function or format, this always holds true. But we look at the different types of assemblies and look at the vapor profiles depending on the climate. And basically during certification, you can get flagged that this assembly doesn't pass and you have to revise the assembly. So we're looking at the vulnerability to mold or, or rot over time because of the vapor profile. And then the unavoidable thermal bridging, maybe a retrofit scenario, you have a large thermal bridge. We wanna make sure it doesn't get too cold on the interior of that um, or have a high enough relative humidity on the interior surface to grow mold. Okay. 
I have a quick question, which Lisa, you can um, push later if you're going to address this, but someone asked about software and platforms used to collect model and report data on the buildings. I think this kind of has a couple different stages. Yeah, what softwares are used to collect model and report data? Collect, that one I don't, there's a couple different, well, maybe this is more of a later, this is more of a monitored data question, um, but there's some, I don't know, there's Energy Star Portfolio Manager, there's systems called like WeGoWise, WeGoHome, we used to partner with. There's a lot of different monitoring systems out there that you can use to collect data. Um, model data, we all use Wolfie Passive, uh, that's our, our certification compliance modeling tool. And then report, uh, I'm not sure on that one either. Um, but I could have a further conversation with you, um, Elliot, to, to chat about this, maybe through email, and give you some resources. Um, I saw a question, okay, you have that, you answered that one. And James, I'll send you the link to the uh, calculators page on our website. I'll drop it in the chat for everyone. Yep. Yeah, there's a calculators and protocols page, Jenny, if you could do that one. And then also maybe the 2021 page, which shows the calculators I'm showing here, or the target calculator. Yeah, thank you. Okay, and I see a question about the password system related to the BC step code five requirements. That's outside of my wheelhouse. Um, I don't know enough about those. I think they're fairly similar though. Um, I know the BC step code is really progressive, but I, I can't tell you details about how, how closely those relate. I'm sorry. Okay. I'm going to keep going now, unless there's more. Okay. Then the last one is the overall impact. And this is the one that, um, you know, really hits on the, the impact or the, the mission of FIAS, right? We're trying to mitigate and adapt to climate change, but mostly mitigate as much as we can. Um, so what is the overall impact of our buildings? And this is this is measured by the net source energy reading of the building or um, model value. So the question here that we had to set is when do you stop with conservation and turn to renewables to get to zero? So we figured out how far you go with passive measures, but then there's active measures. You can get better equipment efficiencies, better appliances, better lighting, lower plug loads, whatever. You can apply more principles to lower your energy use before turning to renewables. So we kind of had to set a limit there or a target. Um, so the terms that we're, we're using here are site energy, which is, let's just say all the energy you use in the building shows up on your utility bill. There's no requirement for FIAS certification, but we do start with site energy to get source energy. So we take the site energy and multiply it by a source energy factor based on fuel type. So this is kind of where that CO2 equivalent comes in, um, instead of being CO2 equivalent, it's source energy. Uh, electricity has a future looking primary energy factor, which I think I have a slide on, um, but basically one kilowatt hour of electricity used at the site is equivalent to 1.8 at the source, whereas one kilowatt hour of natural gas at the site is equal to 1.1 kilowatt hour of uh, natural gas at the source. So it's trying to measure overall impact based on how, based on emissions associated with the different fuel types. And the electricity is based on like a national grid mix. So how good is the US grid? How good's the Canada grid? Whereas natural gas is kind of the same everywhere. Um, so the goals here with our program are to take the baseline building, apply passive building strategies and active, get some, some better equipment and meet this core target. And that's, that's what it means, the core sweet spot for conservation and then add renewables and get to zero. So if, if you guys have heard of PS in the past, we kind of had this in-between spot. We removed it. We said, okay, we just have a conservation target and a zero target. And we're really promoting the zero. That's really what we want to see. But the FIAS core is for those that don't want to delve into the renewable space and they just want to design a really good building. We don't want to leave that behind. Um, so that, that's our core program versus zero program. And uh, another way to look at it here is uh, we have a baseline building. We reduce it quite a bit. This one shows about 50%. Again, you guys know that it's not always 50%. It might be 35, it might be 60, it might be 70, it depends on the building. Um, so you use those strategies to reduce it to the core level. And then you can turn off site. So the core stays on the building boundary. And then zero, you can use on and off site renewables. And I'll show you a, a slide about, about those. <clears throat> so 
A lot of people have heard of the zero code developed by Architecture 2030. And essentially the same concepts exist here, design an energy efficient building and address the building's remaining needs with on-site or off-site renewable energy. Uh, the difference here is the definition of energy efficient building that they go to. So they say the latest and greatest IECC or ASHRAE code designed to that and then go to renewables. Whereas we say go to FIAS core, push further with conservation. Um, so the budgets here, for source energy. Uh, for core, it varies. And that's in that calculate. I think it's actually next, sorry, yeah. Um, so the core target varies because this is a conservation target. So it depends on the, the typology or the density of the building. And then zero is always zero. That's what's nice about a zero target. It's zero, doesn't matter the units, it's zero. Um, for non-residential or commercial buildings, it's per square foot and it's uh, 24 and a half. KBT per square foot per year. This is the same as it was with 2018 and 2015, if anyone's familiar with that, um, but we reduced it down to reflect the new grid electricity value. But basically it's per square foot. And if the building has process loads, it, it increases based on those process loads. Okay. So you come back to this handy dandy tar uh, calculator. So the source energy target varies based on typology, residential versus non, the density of the building in terms of the people, and then the cert certification level. So core, it'll spit out a number for you over here and zero will always say zero. <clears throat> so if, um, if you want to use renewable energy for core, you can use a very small amount of on-site renewable energy. And basically you can account for whatever you're producing and using at the same time. So if you have PV on your roof, whatever you're using and producing at the same time can be counted. We have a little calculator for how much that is, but nothing else counts. So again, it's really trying to be a conservation target. Whereas with zero, we understand you have to push beyond the building boundary sometimes. You can't, can't go to zero with conservation. We know that, that would be ridiculous. Um, so we have different weighting factors for the renewable energy. So there's a weighting factor of one for onsite re renewable energy, which is weighted the highest. Um, and then everything offsite is rated a little bit lower directly owned, community renewable energy, virtual power point purchase agreements, and then renewable energy certificates are rated much, much lower, um, just kind of based on the quality of energy that, that could come out of that type of um, contract. So we are prioritizing on-site renewable energy by giving it a higher weighting factor, but understand that some buildings, it just doesn't make sense to put renewable energy on your roof, or you can't, um, or, there's no solar radiation where you are. It just doesn't make sense. So we have these offsite options. And it mostly aligns with ASHRAE 189 and Architecture 2030. So I just saw that chat question. Adjacent par would adjacent parcels be considered on or offsite? I'm not sure I know the definition of parcels, but neighboring buildings um, would be offsite. So if it's not directly on your building, then it's offsite. Unless you're doing a campus scenario, we do have this kind of in-between scenario where if you have a campus of buildings and you choose to have one um, renewable energy facility on one of the roofs or something, you can have a campus-wide source energy target and meet that, that whole campus target um, with one array or something on your neighbor if you're part of the same campus. So that, that's the only scenario. Okay. so. I think I'm already kind of driven this home, but first conservation, then renewables, first passive, then zero. Um, I won't get too deep into it, but it's really important when we think about the transition to all renewable energy that we need to reduce the loads first. Um, and if we do that, we need less renewable energy to offset those loads. We need less storage to make that renewable energy dispatchable or usable. And we need, um, basically less uh, grid upgrades uh, investment to really facilitate the transition to zero. Um, so I'll, I have another slide on this, but basically these con conservation efforts upfront are gonna be critical, especially as we continue adding net zero buildings into the grid. It doesn't help to continue to add lots and lots and lots of PV in the middle of the day and California sees that every day. Um, doesn't help. So we need to reduce at the building level um, to 
to make this a, a worthwhile or less costly effort to get to clean a clean energy future. Oh, I'm sorry, duplicate slide. Okay, so getting to zero with passive building baseline, we went through these a bit. So quality, health, durability at the absolute base or the foundation of a good building, use the passive conservation strategies, use the active conservation strategies and you're at core. Then use on-site renewable and off-site and you're at zero. And our certification framework is specifically set up to lead you through this hierarchy, right? So we just learned about the quality assurance. So air tightness, moisture control, third-party prerequisite programs lay that foundation. The passive conservation strategies are defined with the, the space conditioning demands on load targets. So that tells you how far to go with passive. The core net source energy target tells you how far to go to with active conservation strategies and zero. The zero target tells you how much renewable energy you need to offset this on an annual basis. So certification framework is very much setting you on the path to zero. Seeing another question here. If the factor for natural gas is one, does that mean it's easier to achieve the primary energy or source energy threshold with natural gas? Um, not necessarily. So the factor for gas is 1.1. I'm going back too far here. Um, is 1.1 for natural gas and grid electricity is 1.8 in the US, 1.96 in Canada. Again, the US reflects a future number. Um, the reason it's not easier for gas is because the equipment that's used, the, the equipment that uses gas is not as efficient as electric equipment. So um, kind of theoretical maximum for equipment using gas is 100%. It's probably around 90, 80. Um, so you have to consider that efficiency in tandem with the source energy factor, where something using electricity can have an efficiency of 300, 350%. This is CO, the coefficient of performance that the COP can be in the threes, maybe even up to four, often at least in the 200% efficiency. So when you consider that percentage efficiency with the source energy factor, um, they're on a much more level playing field. And actually grid electricity with the higher performing like heat pump system performs much better from a source energy perspective than a gas furnace with the natural gas source energy factor. So it's kind of just because the equipment using gas is less efficient, gas is still gonna play out much worse. Um, if the grid electricity was up to like three, then they'd be almost equal. But right now, grid electricity is definitely favored by using these numbers. And that was part of the intent also of looking at a 2050 mix um, right now, it's actually only around two and a half to three on the grid, but we looked at out to 2050 in order to kind of incentivize electrification because most buildings that are built today, hopefully that's about halfway through the lifespan. They should still be around. And we want to actually um, kind of reflect what's actually going to be happening with that building. Okay, so maybe I shouldn't have done that. Okay, so. This is kind of what I was getting into earlier, but I want to really reiterate this. Um, this is something I'm really interested in as well as kind of looking out from the system boundary, sorry, from the building boundary to a whole system, including the electric grid. So there is a ripple effect of conservation that ripples through the entire electric grid. So once you expand from your building boundary, you have to think about the amount of renewable energy that's needed to offset your building's energy use, the amount of storage that might be needed to make that renewable energy either available more often or dispatchable, right? So they're storing some in the, in the evening or at different times, or to meet a critical load of the building, there's gonna to need to be energy storage. And then there's also gonna to need to be transmission to get the energy production to where the load is. And there's gonna be investments in all of that, right? So if we take that top scenario and say this is a baseline and we reduce it by 40% in terms of what we, the energy that the building actually uses using conservation measures, it's very realistic for a passive building reduced by 40%. We now need 40% less renewable energy. We need much less storage and we need much less transmission. So the investment in conservation upfront doesn't just save you on operational energy costs, it ripples through the entire system. And as we think about um, trying to clean up all of the existing grid and electrifying buildings, so we're adding more load to the grid and electrifying vehicles and trying to meet all of that with clean energy resources, this is going to be so, so, so important um, that this kilowatt hour saved here means so much to the other end. So I just wanna really reiterate that. And that is really why you need to go all the way to 
we encourage going all the way to passive levels before going to zero. Not need. I understand there's there are hurdles, but there's justification too. Okay. Okay, so a new approach for FIAS Core. Um, I'm not gonna dive too deep into this, but I want you guys to also know this in case anyone works on single family projects out there or the curious homeowners. We had a couple of those in the beginning. So um, there's a prescriptive path for our core certification. And what that means is you're not doing an energy model. Um, so if you're a single family duplex or townhome building uh, and you're not doing Wolfie passive modeling, you can meet this core through a series of um, essentially checklist requirements. There's a little bit of performance trade-off if you wanna use it, but you don't have to. Um, so this is kind of the hierarchy here. At core, we've got performance. And if you wanna to go to zero, we've got zero, but then we've also got this kind of um, different arm for the prescriptive for core. And the general scope limitations is all I'm really gonna get into. It has to be single family detached or attached. There's a certain limit on how big it is relative to how many people are in it. Um, so we don't want to make mansions out of this. It's not the goal. Um, basically, the goal of this, the um, the tagline for 2020, 2021 was emissions down, scale up. So we're trying to drive emissions down, have this zero path. We're also trying to scale up. We want to make passive building more accessible to everyone. Um, so we're trying to make a more accessible path for um, for single family homes that may not have the budget to do all the excessive energy modeling and things like that. Okay, so no fossil fuel combustion equipment, yours has to be electric, um, no jetted tubs or indoor pools and no natural draft fireplaces. So we definitely limited the scope, right? We definitely limited the scope. It's the easiest to tackle first. And it has uh, requirements in these different buckets. So the scope limitations I just showed you, but then also these uh, kind of six green buckets here are all related to passive measures, air tightness, compactness, solar protection, the thermal enclosure, moisture risk, um, both in the building assembly and uh, with window condensation that we talked about and mechanical ventilation. And then we kind of have these active conservation buckets of mechanical system efficiency, lighting appliances and hot water. Um, so it's pretty comprehensive and it's made up of universal requirements that apply to all buildings as well as building specific and climate specific requirements. And another tool we have on our website, it's also available at the link uh, Jenny sent to the 2021 page earlier, it's called our prescriptive snapshot. And what this does is it provides a snapshot and just that for um, your building in any given climate size with a certain number of bedrooms or stories. It tells you basically what the project or climate specific requirements would be for your building um, with the, these parameters. So it tells you the, you know, the wall R values you need, the U value you need, um, the whole window solar heat gain that you're allowed to have, the mechanical equipment efficiencies. So it's, it's just a snapshot. If you want a starting point, even if you're doing the performance program, if you want a starting point, this is a really good starting point for a single family home. A really good starting point. And these are all the parameters you'd have to meet to meet the prescriptive path. It is definitely not as flexible as the performance path because it is prescriptive, we need to keep it keep it tight. We had to limit things like the envelope area for compactness. You know, it's it's definitely more stringent, but it's it's simpler. Um, it's more understandable, I think, than an energy model. <clears throat> I won't go deep into these, but this is also posted on that web page reference tables. So basically, these are the results. If you took this snapshot and put it through all the climate zones, these are the ranges that you'd get per climate zone. So let's say you're in climate zone 5A, all the climate zones in 5A, my walls and overhanging floors, the requirement range from 32 to 52. This is also a really good starting point. Start at the low end, start at the high end, whatever. start at the low end and see if, well actually start with the snapshot. <laughs> but if you're doing the performance path, you can start with these ranges, right? The snapshot's exact, these are just ranges. Um, so it kind of just guides you to what roughly would be meeting your targets but if you know your location, just pick that. Or if you work in one climate zone specifically, but all ranges of it, then you could use this table and say, okay, I'm in climate zone six. I can just go to the high end of this and I know it's gonna meet everything in climate zone six. So I, I'll just, that's how I'll design my buildings. I won't have to do an energy model. This is all the, zone, the buildings I design in climate zone six will pass as long as I use the high end of this range, if that makes sense. 
Um, same thing, but a little bit uh, more about solar protection and mechanical efficiencies. A lot less climate dependent. Um, the solar protection is climate dependent and the mechanical ventilation, but then the heating and cooling equipment, way less climate dependent, really depending on if you're in a, a climate that needs um, dehumidification or not. But again, this is on our, our website. Okay. Checking on time. Okay. So after passive building metrics are met, what other uh, provisions support building decarbonization? So with 2021, we really made a step to get further. Um, so I mentioned that combustion is not allowed with FIAS core prescriptive. It's also not allowed with FIAS zero. So we want to get to all electric, but we're not forcing it. So with FIAS core, combustion is okay, but it must be electrification ready. So basically, it must be able to be ready to move to the all electric um, future. And we also have electric vehicle readiness requirements based on the number of parking spaces required. This is another one of those things, kind of like solar ready, which is a requirement based on zero energy ready home, that it's a minimal cost to implement upfront. But if you wanted to do it in 10 years from now, it's going to cost a lot more. So we're trying to kind of just plant these seeds that help the decarbonization movement forward and trying to do it at the point in time where it's going to cost the least um, or make the, make the least amount of impact so that we know, okay, they're EV ready and you can add a charger in the future for much lower cost than if you didn't do it at all and had to you know, rewire, um, add space for it, everything like that. Do it in the design phase and we know it's, it's ready for the future. Okay, so product certification and building your team. <clears throat> Are there any more questions? Yep. Everyone doing okay? Yes? <laughs> it's okay. I think we have a question that you're just about to answer, so go for it. Okay. Okay, so we've got the two levels of certification again. We got core and zero. Um, just to give you a little bit of a snapshot as to where this stuff is happening. Lots in the Northeast, a decent amount on the West Coast. We're starting to sprinkle in the Midwest, um, but we're kind of missing the South. But again, lots of movement in the Northeast. A lot of this is driven by incentives. But these buildings are coming in around with site EUIs around 10 to 25 kBTU per foot square per year. EUI is just an energy use intensity. And those, those are the units there <clears throat> per square foot. And they're about 20 to 50% better than the zero energy ready home projects in terms of energy performance. Um, these are the numbers over time. We had a little bit of a dip in 2020 in terms of pre-certified and certified projects, but it's been pretty exponential. This is square footage. Um, so we kind of have been doubling each year. Last year, as you guys all know, there was a lot of limitation with people going out on site and verifying projects. So the amount of actual final certifications that cleared um, was just it was just slower, um, but we we think things are still on track um, to pretty much continue to double <clears throat> this upcoming year. And this is just another representation of where projects are. Again, lots on the East Coast, lots in New York and Pennsylvania. Also, incentives there to do it. Massachusetts is also picking up steam too. I think this is a little bit outdated. Massachusetts is, is pretty high up there. Um, in terms of source zero projects, we've got 82 total, about an even split of ones that are in process versus pre-certified versus certified. And um, now we'll get into building your project team for project certification. So this is our professional suite. We've got CPHCs, which are generally the architects, engineers. It sounded like most people on this call would be part of that role, um, at least based on the percentages Jenny was listing off there. So. Um, they are required for a project. They are involved early in the design. They're the ones doing the energy modeling and or the prescriptive path checklist, if that's the route you're going. Um, they're not required for the prescriptive path, but if they're on the team for the prescriptive path, they'd be the one handling that. And they are sure that the project's meeting all the requirements. They're the ones that are making sure the building design is going to meet all those um, performance requirements as well as the third party quality assurance requirements. We also have a builder or contractor uh, training. It's not required, but it's highly recommended. Um, definitely for the first time as well, like making sure you meet that air tightness requirement. Um, super important to have someone that understands what's going on and maintaining the quality and oversight during the construction phase. 
Um, so, and they also understand the building science and the products that are going into the building. So highly encouraged to have a certified builder, but at this time it's not required. And then we have the Rater Verifier, which is the on-site quality assurance professional. It, they are required. They're hired during the design to also look at the design and make sure it's meeting all those third-party requirements as well as to, as well as the FIAS requirements. And again, they're coming to the site multiple times throughout construction to, um, to inspect insulation, uh, to do ventilation commissioning, to do blower door testing. And the rater is kind of aligning with the HERS resident rater used for single family and low rise multifamily, whereas the verifier is used for non-residential, commercial, and the high rise multifamily buildings. Um, so this is your ideal team to have one in each of these categories. You must have one in the, the far uh, left and far right. And the certification, the actual building certification process is two parts. Um, we have the pre-certification or design certification, which happens during the design stage. So the, the certified passive house consultant, the CPHC submits a project and there's a back and forth process with FIAS um, to kind of go through all the different inputs in the energy model and make sure they're consistent with the design. And it's really quite comprehensive. I know some of you on this call have gone through the process. It's, it's no, um, walk in the park. We're looking at everything, but that's really too, <laughs> yeah, Enrique's like, no, it's not. <laughs> yeah, so we're, we're looking at everything, um, but that's really to help your team and make sure these are successful projects. So we're, we're looking at every input in the model, all of your drawings, we're looking for thermal bridging, we're looking for moisture control and assemblies, we're looking at everything. Um, and then once we get through that feedback process, we stamp it and we say, okay, it's pre-certified. And if you can build it to the design, that was pre-certified and pass all of the on-site quality assurance testing, then you get the final certification. So the rater is the one or the verifier is the one involved in doing the final testing. And then they submit those documents to FIAS after the building's built. We true up that final energy model to as built, hopefully not a lot of differences between the as built and the design. And that's when the certification, the, the final certification happens. Um, so you wanna get the pre-certification submission in early early in the design stage. Don't start construction and then start pre-certification. Ideally, pre-certification is happening in tandem with the design and then construction can start after it's pre-certified. That is the ideal scenario because there are red flags and things that come up in certification reviews that could prevent a project that was already under construction from being certified if it's too late to change it. And the cheapest time to change anything is early, right? So we don't wanna grab something late in the design and just throw a wrench in it at that point, and then you might have to, or might not be able to certify the project. So we'll work with you as much as we can, as long as you're early enough to change things in the design. Lisa, can you touch on how retrofits might be part of, have a process similar or different, how a retrofit is different? Um, yeah, so I would, <laughs> retrofit before you start any of the retrofitting. So essentially consider that the construction part of it. Um, when you're doing the design portion of the retrofit is also when you'd be doing the design review from FIAS and don't begin the retrofit work until you have that pre-certification. Yeah, good question. <clears throat> okay, so the whole building performance is based on model use when you have the model um, and then it's quality assured on site. So we don't do any requirements for monitoring the certification can happen right after we kind of uh, give an approval on the final documentation. And it's not like you have to meet a certain thing for a certain amount of time or you know, meet a certain energy budget. It's all based on a model. And a lot of the reason behind that is because, um, because we're certifying the building and not the occupants. So there can be a lot of variability. You could have um, people that are really, really conscious of their energy use in a building and they could actually perform significantly better than a model, whereas you could have um, people that don't even know they're in a passive building, like a lot of affordable housing units. And, you know, there's people that are completely aware and trying to reduce energy. And then there's people that just aren't aware of it at all. And you're not penalized for your building design based on like plug loads and occupant behavior. So it's, we're certifying the building with standardized inputs for occupants and knowing that things will fluctuate. And if we do the monitored data portion, I can show you how much that actually does fluctuate. Um, but this is, this is one kind of overall slide about measured versus model performance across different projects. So 
Um, down here, each of these charts is a different project number. The blue is the model, no, the model energy use intensity or EUI, KBTU per square foot. And the red is the measured. So you can see they're kind of across the board. These are in different climates, different building typologies across the US and Canada. But the important thing, at least in my mind, is this middle, these middle dashed lines. Um, so this is the average modeled around 15, 15.6 it says, and then the average measured is 16.7. So overall, that's a 7% difference across all different buildings in different climate zones between the modeled and the measured. So even if each individual building isn't hitting its mark perfectly, we know there's gonna be fluctuation, right? Based on occupants, based on other things related to the design, be different climate, like lots of things can change this. But overall, we're really close to hitting the mark on what we're actually expecting with performance. And this is, this is the goal. Okay, so jumping through to some common design features. Okay, so that's just clarification there. Thanks, Joe. Um, okay. So just a little bit more about these passive principles and how these are commonly used. Um, so if we dive into the continuous insulation, some common things you might see um, for mitigating thermal bridges or structural thermal breaks. So this is the Aqua Tower in Chicago. Um, thermal breaks were value engineered out of the design here. So you can see that the heat from the inside of the building is coming right out into this structural slab that bridges from the inside to outside. So it looks more like um, this graphic on the middle down below. And what that's doing more than just losing heat, um, it's creating uncomfortable spaces on the inside and it's also creating the potential for mold or rot on the inside. Um, so what we're doing is we're adding something like a structural thermal break up here where it has a less conductive material so that the heat doesn't just transfer right through that concrete slab. And it's creating more space. It's creating more comfortable space. And if you, you know, one thing that's not talked about often is like a, a high rise apartment, you don't have that much space. But if the space around next to all the windows becomes more usable, that's actually a lot more valuable as a property than something that has all this unusable space next to this uncomfortable, um, uncomfortable um, thermal bridge junction with the um, with the balcony. So common is structural thermal breaks. Could be like this. They're not always this extreme. Um, kind of another example of this, far less extreme, is just a fastener, thermally broken fasteners that help fasten exterior insulation. And they um, then you can hang the cladding on that fastener. So instead of using something con conductive, like a big screw or nail, um, you can use something thermally broken that's structural. This one's called the Cascadia clip. Um, and this is just an example of mold. Beautiful. I, I only have one side with mold, I think, on it. Sorry, guys. Um, but this is an example of if you didn't um, thermally break this uh, corner, it can get cold enough or have a high enough relative humidity on the interior to grow mold. But if it's thermally broken, then it keeps it warm and it reduces that uh, potential for mold. Um, some sample details, I thought I'd throw them in here just for anyone that's in that one or maybe two category. Just, um, this is probably the most uh, common type of wall solution we see. So you've got your structure to the inside. This is a two by six. And then you've got your exterior rigid insulation to the outside. And all of your control layers are in between that. And this is common. It works in every single climate. The ratios between that interior kind of fluffy insulation and the exterior rigid insulation change based on your climate. The amount, the thickness you need changes based on your climate, but that um, kind of hierarchy of those layers are tried and true. And this is, this is what we see on, I don't know what percentage, but a high percentage of our projects. And what I also wanted to show here was kind of the transition detail between the um, above grade wall and the below grade wall down here, how uh, there's the, um, the floor truss here and they used a continuous insulation kind of bridging from up here, I guess being continuous from up here. They used kind of a spray foam insulation on the edge of this to continue that thermal break between the inside and outside and then carried that into the rigid insulation that they brought to the inside of their uh, below grade wall. This is a nice detail, um, common, very common to see something like this. This is a project in, in Salt Lake City from Dave Brock. So this is one of the sample projects we use in the CPHC training. 
Okay, so going into airtight construction, the uh, kind of the rule with the airtightness um, and with the thermal control layer, but with the airtight layer is you should be able to draw this all the way around and, and um, identify the material that is going to be your airtight layer all the way around your building without picking up your pen. So make sure your airtight layer is continuous and make sure you know what is actually at that junction, right? You can just draw the line and be like, okay, that's it. Like make sure there's sheathing there or tape or whatever it's actually going to be. Um, most people use the sheathing as the airtight layer. And like I said, it's generally in the middle of the wall like this, protected in the middle, in the middle of the wall, the floor, the roof, but make it protected. Often I think sheathing or tape sheathing works really well. You can see a spray applied air barrier happening over on the right, off, also an option. I'm not too familiar with this. This is stuff you'd learn all about in with the full, um, the builder training will get more into detail with the specifics here, but you'll also learn about more about this in the CPHC training. Um, here's some sample, a different sample assembly. This is a wall in plan view. You've got your interior frame wall, and then you've got your insulation in a TJI, like a truss joist to the outside. And the airtight layer and the vapor control layer is in the middle. It's this sheathing, either plywood or OSB. OSB. It's the air control and vapor control. And then kind of the same thing, they used a bunch of uh, fluffy loose fill insulation here in the, in the attic and connecting this to the wall. So they took the air and vapor control here and then they must have figured out a way at here at the top, this top stud to kind of tape over or tape to that air control layer in the wall and continue that on through the roof. And you need to make sure that the air control layer is continuous and detailed. And this is something we also look at in the, in the certification review. Um, ventilation, the only thing I really wanted to touch on um, is the different scenarios people might do in a multifamily application. So we see a, a pretty even distribution of having ventilation units per dwelling unit or semi-centralized, which would mean um, per floor or maybe per couple floors, you have one large piece of ventilation equipment that serves those floors, or you have a little one in each dwelling unit. There's advantages and disadvantages of both. Uh, the least common and is, is really only possible with like a low rise multifamily is a centralized system with something maybe on the roof or a mechanical space. Um, it gets very challenging in anything bigger than a low rise to have a centralized mechanical or centralized ventilation system. Um, but we see all different approaches with, with the ventilation systems. You know, we have some recommended ventilation rates, um, mostly just related to exhaust rates. So these are recommended exhaust rates in different uh, exhaust rooms. So kitchens and bathrooms absolutely have to have uh, ventil exhaust ventilation. Uh, the minimums are actually set by Energy Star. So the minimum for a kitchen is 25, the minimum for a bathroom is 20. But we have you know, kind of starting point rates that are a little bit higher than that, maybe a little bit more geared to single family. Half bathrooms uh, don't have the same requirement. There's no shower. So we have about half of that. And then we also recommend exhausting in laundry rooms and mechanical rooms. Just anywhere that heat might generate, you kind of just want to um, kind of dilute that from the space. And here's a sample layout. Let me check time again. Okay. Um, I'm not going to go too detailed into this, but you can kind of see the red is the exhaust happening in the bathrooms and the kitchens. And the blue is the supply happening in bedrooms and living spaces. There is a requirement to supply fresh air to bedrooms. Um, so that's generally the bedrooms and living rooms. Is, there's no requirement for living rooms, but often there's fresh air supplied to living rooms and then exhaust air coming from bathrooms and kitchens and laundry rooms maybe. And you're doing this in a balanced way. So the total exhaust must match the total supply, both in design and tested on site. And there's a lot more of this where that came from at the, at the summit. It's okay, Jenny, go ahead. We have a question about uh, ventilation scenarios, I think, and then crawl spaces and ARVs. Any option for control scenarios for ventilation versus continuous? Um, yeah, okay, so control scenarios, I'm thinking you're talking about like demand controlled ventilation. So yes, there is an option to have demand controlled ventilation. It's a little bit more challenging in terms of like commissioning. 
but there is the option, yes, if you know that the, if you can prove and commission that the system will run up to a certain rate based on CO2 or particulate matter in the space, there's a couple of units that have um, been in certified projects that can achieve that. Um, so yes, it's, it's possible versus continuous, but there's almost always continuous, at least a low flow with those, or there's some sort of research mode um, where over time, the total amount of airflow is the same. If it's not continuous, you need to make sure that over the course of the hour or something, you're getting the same amount of, of ventilation or fresh air. And what about crawl spaces and ERV? Um, can you elaborate on that, Keith? Yeah, if I have a insulated crawl space, insulated to the earth and the interior frost walls are insulated. Mm -hmm. So my crawl space is part of my heating envelope and my air infiltration envelope. Mm -hmm. Do you, do I provide vents into my crawl space or do I provide ducts going into my crawl space? Yeah. Um, yeah, you could definitely probably, I don't know that you have to, you could supply and exhaust a very small amount from that. You definitely wouldn't vent it to the outdoors, um, but you no. could, yeah, you could, I don't think people have, um, if nothing is down there, if you have any equipment down there, you might want to, but if nothing's so down the there. Natural, the, there's a porosity between the first floor living room, kitchen, bedrooms, and the crawl space below it. I just mm -hmm. let that, I let the air infiltrate back and forth and, and don't worry about it. I think right? it should be fine. I mean, if that's part of your enclosure, Mm -hmm. And if it's sealed, and on the edges, it depends also what you've got going on at the floor level in there. I mean, it's like the detail you showed where with the insulation on the rim joist going down to some rigid insulation on the inside of that concrete wall. Um, what, what about at the ground level? Uh, insulation and air infiltration plastic across the whole bottom that, there. That should be fine then, yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't know that there's a need to ventilate in the crawl space, but I'm not 100% sure on that. I don't mm -hmm. think we often see that. I can recall seeing like very low flows, but if no one's ever going down there and it's not even accessible, I mean, and it, there's yeah. no equipment down there, I don't, I don't think there's much of a need for it, no. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm gonna keep moving. I'm just gonna warn you guys, we're probably not gonna get to the adventure, but that's okay. Um, okay, so minimize the uh, efficient mechanical systems. So just a little bit on this. Again, we have a whole summit on this next week, so I'm not going to dive into it too much. But typically, passive buildings are all electric. Um, like we were talking about earlier, that's the best way to meet your source energy targets. Um, lots of VRF, which is variable refrigerant flow systems, which is a kind of distributed heat pump system. Um, VRFs for larger scale. Uh, but that's typically what we see, heat pump systems, whether it's air source or ground source heat pump. And then a lot of the heat pump water heaters for water heating and a lot of on-demand recirculation systems for water heating as well, which just helps save on distribution energy for water, um, water distribution, hot water distribution. And we just had a webinar this week actually on hot water distribution from some of our technical certification staff. Um, so lots, lots out there on, on our water distribution methods. Here is the code. For anyone that is a CPHC, it sounded like there were a couple that said they were in the beginning. So the code to self-report this webinar is 45112. Maybe screenshot it and write it down. And you'll get it again. I think it'll go out in the email. Yeah. OK, so we have 15 to 20 minutes. Um, I don't know if I want to do the poll. I think I would like to do the great <laughs> the breakout room group activity. I kind of think I just want to default to this um, based on the amount of time and because I kind of want to hear from you guys um, a little bit more. Yeah, because I can provide the slides. I have the slides for all of this in this presentation that you guys are going to get afterwards. So if you're really interested, there's a deeper dive on the energy model calculations and tools. So Wolfie Passive, Wolfie Pro Therm, kind of just showing how they work. Um, some passive project case studies, really just some pretty pictures and showing all the different projects. And then some monitored data that actually shows the real performance of the buildings versus the modeled. 
Um, but I think this might be a little more beneficial. You guys can meet some people, assuming the breakout rooms work. Um, and I think it's like the perfect amount of time to be able to do this. Uh, so the breakout rooms, Jenny, let me see if I can do this. Um, seem to be locked out of some stuff. Dang it. It's not available for me. Is it available for you? Um, is it, where would I? It's up, it's down in the bottom, um, like next to where the poles and stuff would be. Oh, here it is. Okay, I can do it. Um, okay, so I'm gonna assign you guys into eight rooms. Uh, so you're gonna have four to five people in each room. Um, so you guys can meet each other and also answer these questions. And I want you guys basically, I think it'll be helpful to hear from you guys. Um, what's the most helpful thing you've learned today? Because if you think it's helpful, other people might think it's helpful, right? So I'm gonna I'm gonna take notes on these. What's the most helpful thing you've learned today? And then what's the biggest hurdle to you to implementing this type of thing in your work? Maybe you already do, but what's the biggest hurdle you experience? Like, what are you missing? What resources are you missing? And this is gonna help us, me, Fias. Um, I can collect what resources we have if you say you're missing this type of resource but also it helps us know where the research is needed and what we need to get to our community to help further our mission of making passive building mainstream. Um, so we'll give you 10 minutes, it's 43. I'm gonna create the rooms, but make sure you answer these two questions. Maybe take a screen clip or mentally uh, remember these things most helpful and what, what resource or hurdle or what, what's the biggest kind of hurdle to implementation and assign a, sp a spokesperson and we'll try to get through um, those eight spokespeople once we come back to close out the workshop. So you should see something come up. If you're not familiar with breakout rooms, it's gonna pop up and say, go to this room. And then it'll say, leave room and come back. Don't just leave, please. I wanna hear from you guys. So you'll come back to the main room after 10 minutes and we'll go through um, what you guys had to say. So I'm gonna create, open. So you should be getting those notifications now.
I'll see you're back, Jenny. Uh, it gives him a minute. Okay. I can't hear you. Very muted. <laughs> I'm back. My group is back. We had some good, good discussion. Awesome. And it was great. We had someone from New Jersey and someone from Northern California. Oh. Uh, and so just some notes. Maybe we could talk or touch on incentives, like where incentives are and where to find them. And uh -huh. Someone asked a question earlier about like, how does passive building line up with the future of climate change, like future temperatures? Um, but I don't, I don't know if we know how to address that. Yeah, I can try. Okay. Let me see open back. We've got six seconds. Oh, and mark, mark, finding passive house clients. Um, how? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so that's a resource needed. Yes. Okay. I think everybody is back. Mm -hmm. Works about right. S sorry if I sent anyone to a room alone. <laughs> Some people popped off after I created the rooms. I knew it was going to happen, but I apologize to anyone that was sitting there alone. I tried to move you into a room. Okay. Hopefully that was helpful and hopefully it was nice to meet some of the other faces on the screen. Um, so you can see my, my Word doc in front of my PowerPoint, right? Yes. Okay, so <clears throat> we're gonna go through the well, eight groups. We've got eight minutes, perfect. Everyone's got 60 seconds. So what's that most helpful thing you've learned today and then the biggest hurdle? Um, so I don't know where your group numbers were and you probably don't either. So if any of spokespeople just wanna 
speak up. I'll be taking notes here. So, anyone? Sure, uh, my name is Eric Masterson. Um, we most helpful today was, you know, anything understanding um, a, a path to to a passive house or net zero for existing buildings. Um, you know, what any retrofit requirements or design features that are out there. I know we, we didn't hit it a lot, but mm -hmm. that's what we had focused on. Mm -hmm. And then what's the bit, biggest hurdle for us in our work is that retrofit scenario to try to hit net zero um, on, on existing buildings. Mm -hmm. Definitely. And that's a, it's really an ongoing challenge. And there's <laughs> lots and lots of work being done on that, small, small scales to large scales. Uh, across the country with, yeah. Um, one of the big ones we're involved in is the RMI Realize project where they're kind of looking at um, a solution to mass retrofitting with like exterior panelized systems, but you kind of have to define the typology that's the lowest hanging fruit or has the most potential for, um, for retrofitting. And then they target that and the are starting on their first pilot project with that right now. But that's, that's really a large scale approach on it, but all these individual, Single family homes need to be retrofitted too. So, okay. Sorry, I took part of your minute. Okay, next group. Thank you, that was helpful. I have a cup. this is James Storms. I have a couple of questions in general. Uh, this was helpful because it was an overview and there's a lot of these, these concepts that I know, but one of the things I was interested in is, is, and I, is to become a certified designer is a passive house institute. And I, I was surprised to learn you actually are not just residents in houses, but also commercial buildings, correct? Right, uh, yep. Because currently I'm an architect for a, a, a state college and we build a lot of educational buildings. And a lot of the concepts I see, they're kind of there. We build a lot of buildings with rain screen and insulation. The insulation is usually on the inside though here. And I'm in zone one in ah, Florida. Okay, that makes sense. At the bottom. So I don't see a whole lot of, and I know it's a little different when you got a hot, humid, wet climate on the coast, you have different issues. Definitely. There, the only project I saw was up in Northern Florida. I'd like to know if you could share some things on courses that we should look at if there are, are any projects mm -hmm. that deal with that. And mm -hmm. also, are there any cost information? When you talk to clients, a lot of times they want to know what, how much more is it going to cost me to build a, a passive house, either a, you know, con, uh, a house that conserves energy or a net zero house yep. uh, and the certification process. Like in LEED, it used to, we used to know what that cost. And mm -hmm. then we actually went to the uh, International Green Construction Code because it was more of a building code and it was something sure. that had to do and not just did for points. Sure, sure. So yeah, there is the issue that it's a voluntary certification. Um, we do have a cost data kind of calculator. It is theoretical. Um, it's based on the optimization that basically said from the baseline to this upgrade package, this is what it costs per square foot. I can definitely shoot that out to all of you guys. Um, and then there's some, there's some studies that are being done. A lot of it's being done on the affordable multifamily sector because those are a lot of the projects that are being funded by external sources and they, they fund the research and um, reporting on the cost as well, because it's really important to them as an investment. Um, typically what we're seeing people report can be anywhere from the same cost. And yes, it's been reported as being the exact same cost as their baseline up to maybe 10% over. Um, and a lot of that can also factor into the local markets. Um, and I was gonna say something. Oh, it also depends on what your baseline is. Um, so where are you coming from? <laughs> depends on how much more it's gonna to cost to get here. So from like 2021 IECC to passive house, it's gonna be a lot less than, you know, if you have no state code mm -hmm. to get to passive house, you know? So it depends on, on what your baseline is. So this is a, it's, a tough co it's a tough question, but it's definitely one that I'm guessing more than one of you um, thought was maybe the biggest hurdle is cost. It's very common um, that people think this is the biggest hurdle. Mm -hmm. uh, we were in the same room. I'm just going to add on. And my name is Tello. Mm -hmm. And uh, I have found that it's either the same, or if you have a contractor who's a little nervous or cocky, it's more. It's, that's <laughs> a, a, a very simple delineation. 
And where where are you located? I'm in Westchester, just north of New York City. Okay. Well, that's great to hear. There we go. Someone that says it's the same. So it's it is about prioritization of funds too. Are you putting it in a fancy cooktop, or are you putting it in you know? If you have a fine installation. And, and the equipment is really a ton of money if if a, a regular standard equipment is thrown in the house with ducting it, it is a tremendous cost and that's where you get the biggest break is now when you don't have to do it yep awesome glad to hear that from you and i'm not the only one preaching it okay next group it's gotta be a um, more. i'll take yeah. a, a chance here I was uh, with uh, Grant, we were just two of us. Um, we discussed uh, commercial buildings, like this in, in the design of, um, of uh, lab laboratory buildings, which is something I think that the FIOS hasn't taken in consideration at this point so far. I'm not sure how much um, FIOS has um, evolved into commercial buildings of that type of uh, like uh, labs or, or hospitals or schools and things like that. Mm -hmm. uh, beside that, uh, one of my biggest hurdle are always the mechanical systems, especially for uh, cooling dehumidification. Uh, we, we don't have, um, actually the uh, equipment manufacturers have, hasn't come up as fast as required uh, for these low load uh, buildings. And that's why I'm looking forward to the to this um, yeah. the summit next week to see what uh, what uh, advances have been done there. Right. Yep. There will be definitely at least a few presentations touching on just that because I think that's still one of the biggest hurdles we have in terms of systems is that latent handling the latent cooling loads, um, especially once you yeah, re reduce the sensible load so much. Yeah. Yeah, and that's becoming more and more an issue because of climate change yep and it's more of an issue in low load buildings specifically too so okay there's more groups right or did they all leave spokespeople leave uh we're here we are uh i don't know if you can hear me we're, we're yeah. um owners from northwestern wisconsin and okay. we plan to build a passive house and have a certified and we've been stumbling and bumbling for the last two years because Minnesota and Wisconsin are in a nearly virtual passive house desert. I mean, it's hard to find, you, it's hard to find information. It, passive house isn't done very often. So builders don't know about it. You, it's hard to get information about it unless you seek it on your own. And um, you unless know, you're in a mess metropolitan area right right unless you're in mm -hmm. wisconsin or uh you know minneapolis minnesota um and and our, the closest cphc is you know four and a half hours from us and um same thing about the raiders so yeah so you can reach out to me and jenny separately we can definitely connect you to the uh, wisconsin past west alliance group if you're not connected to them but also we kind of have a strategy for the Raiders when there's not one in your area, you can find sure. a HERS Raider. Um, and actually we're, I think gonna start a promotion on these deserts, Jenny and I talked about this, trying to actually subsidize some of the training for filling in these uh, dry spots, blank spots on the map to try to get access to all for it, specifically the Raiders and verifiers because those are the ones that are important to be on site. I think working with a consultant a couple hours away is okay, it's not ideal. Um, you mm -hmm. won't be able to see them in person as much, but um, I would I would trust that they understand the climate well enough being in Wisconsin um, to be able to work on your project. And they wouldn't necessarily have to be on site as much as the Raider Verifier. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you. Yes. Talk to the Wisconsin group as well. So they, about things like this. So they're especially primed to it. Good. I understand we're at four, but I want to give everyone a chance to voice their their group's findings. So if you guys can hang tight, if you got to go, I totally understand. Thanks for joining today. Hope it was helpful and we'll send out all those resources. But if there's anyone else, yes. other groups. Yes, in the hurdles section, I think we've got a real challenge in getting the investment communities, mortgage people to know more about 
the benefits of uh, passive house in terms of longevity, in terms of helping people to um, come up with uh, lower energy bills, mm -hmm. uh, to to have a more valuable building at the end of the mortgage as well. Yeah, so it's like the the appropriate like valuation of the product that uh, they're yeah investing in. Yeah, we're starting to get into that, but it's still a bit of a <laughs> bit of a challenge. Um, I'd like to raise one more issue. Mm -hmm. uh, the glazing in the United States is a really truly appalling situation. <laughs> uh, if we if we didn't have Alpen, uh, I mean, I I just I'm I'm finding it after all these years, it's still the largest energy loss. And we don't have any industries that are really helping us out. Yeah, largest industry loss or largest um, energy loss and probably one of the biggest costs, right? Cost in increases over baseline. I, I tried the last year the logic, which are made in Pennsylvania, they are very cost effective and uh, very high quality. So that's one of the companies that probably we could look at. I'm not sure if I heard that. Yeah, I actually didn't touch on it today, but we ha we do have a certified window data program that we're trying to get more manufacturers to be a part of, um, basically so we can get more exposure to them, but also get more resources to our constituents. So they'd just be like certifying the data and or we'd be certifying the data, their performance data, but also like giving them um, kind of climate zone recommendations. So if you're in climate zone five, check out these. Um, we can shoot a link to the, I'll just add a link to the database because we probably have, I don't know, 20 manufacturers in that and we're very actively searching for more now. We're putting a lot into that program um, for windows and ventilation products actually. But when, once you experience the climate zone eight of highest res, uh, sort of efficiency on the windows, you never go to anything else. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was lucky enough to have them in 1995 and it, it was a, that was the transformative moment and it just completely opened up the market for me so yeah that's another big thing i think we we also hear a lot of testimonial about that at our annual conference we have passive house tours um, where they're seeing local passive buildings and um being in one really sells it really, really, really well. <laughs> Makes people really understand the value of the comfort and the, the sound and the way you feel inside of it. But that's something that you can't really display until you like put someone in one, right? So it's a kind of a hard thing to do, but it is a real, a very real, a very real thing. If you are a member though, we did just do a program of, with Passive House owners. If you want their testimonies, um, you can send me an email for access. Oh, cool. I ask you a question. Uh, yes. You put up a you put up a screen a little while ago that had um, the code like a checklist of items, and it, it showed the exterior wall. Let me see if I can. I wasn't able to get a screenshot of it, but is that on your website? Oh yeah, yeah, the prescriptive. prescriptive um, exactly, yep. prescriptive methods and. Yep, I can actually just send out the one-page PDF to this as well. These reference tables. And this It'll is be on in the website. It, it should be on the 2021 page. Okay, cool. Yep. Yeah, because I've been building, um, you know, I've been building Energy Star 3.1 houses, and I'm just looking at how close they are to this. It's not that different. No, it's not. Yeah. Um, and that that's another hurdle we find a lot is people just hear Passive House and they think it's just so far out there that they don't really and then really thinking care. about the um, thinking about the the difference of what you're really going to end up with as far as mechanicals go and the cost difference there. I was just in a class for a Marader as well, okay. for a hers Raider. So mm -hmm. the um, the guy who was teaching the class, he has a, a insulated concrete form house, mm -hmm. and he had like this one little electric heater like one of those oil filled electric heaters and that was his whole heater <laughs> in it's, his house 
and he was in upstate New York, and I was like, wow, that's amazing, you know? It's definitely possible. You can push that far. I don't think you have to, but you definitely can, especially with heating. Um, you can eliminate it altogether. The original concept I heard was heat your heat your home with a hair dryer, and that's it. Um, so it's possible. Uh, I, I wanted to add uh, for windows um, in Wisconsin, there used to be a company called Wasco, which was certified by Fias mm -hmm. out of Milwaukee. However, because they had importation issues, probably from Rehau, because that's where they bought the extrusions for their frames. Um, I understand they had some issues with the importation costs. So essentially, um, they have switched to importing a product from Canada. Prices are still competitive, although they only make or they only offer the UPVC, not not the wood clad ones. So you have to do that. They will paint them in any RAL color, which is a European color, powder coat color. So basically you could get any color you want, uh, but they would be the UPVC, not wood. And if you're selective about which windows are operable and which ones are fixed, if you get fixed ones, they're very price competitive with even average performing US made windows. So um, I would I would offer that as an option. That's something to, to consider just overall too in terms of window cost. If you're willing to do UPVC frames as opposed to wood frames, mm -hmm. um, that makes a big difference. Um, I want to say this is from my perspective and Fia staff might have heard this from me before is one of the things I wish would happen on Fia's checklists or maybe it's a separate checklist mm -hmm. is that it's that there was a checklist that included code mandatory provisions. And the reason I say that is, is it would be nice in the certification process, you're sort of checking off code requirements at the same time. So it isn't a separate process. Um, that's particularly important in Illinois or any state that has statewide codes where the code review process is a little bit more mm -hmm. uh, complete by the code enforcers. Sure, that's it's something where um... We are working on, believe it or not, we actually just had a call with the New York Department of State today to figure out what we had to do to make Wolfie Passive um, compliant for code there. And it, it is a lot of having those mandatory provisions like spelled out in the reports of, of things. And um, and it does help with the dual work as well or not do, double dutying on work. So we are working on it and it might be something we can, hopefully is something we can incorporate in the future. Yeah. Okay. And another thing related to code, uh, before we end is just to make you all aware there is an ASHRAE passive building standard that's currently under development. Um, so that's going to really help get this into codes and into um, other mandates, having code written language about a passive building standard. It's not going to be identical to FIAS. It's not going to be identical to the German passive house standard. It's going to be, it's something that's consensus based and the committee um, is some people from FIAS, some people from passive house institute, some um, just experts in the field, you know, that a whole ton of people um, going through and developing this standard. But I think it could really open some doors in terms of getting it written into, um, getting written into, written into codes and being able to point to it better than pointing to something like this that's developed by a private organization. So look out for that in 2023. Unfortunately, it's a slow process, but two years, hoping, um, hoping that'll be out. I have okay. a question about the summit. I know you mentioned yeah. it, but I don't know anything about it. When is it? What is it? Where's the information? Yep. Uh, next week, it is 4 to 6 p.m. Monday through Thursday, 4 to 6 p.m. Central. I'm sorry. Um, Jenny, if you could paste the link in the chat to summit.fias.org, that tells you all about it. Um, but basically, it's a pr progression from basic things about mechanical systems, best practices, system solutions, case studies, and then gets into kind of the future of um, synergies between mechanical systems and the grid and um, 
renewables and things like that. So it kind of progresses in terms of complexity as the week goes along. And then there's also pre-recorded content that's associated with each day. So those two hours are live. There's a headline presentation. And then each pre-recorded speaker will talk for two, three, five minutes on their topic from the pre-recorded just as a summary. And then there's gonna be a panel discussion for all of those people following, which also includes Q&A from the audience. And if you are not able to attend at that time, it will be recorded. So if you register, you will have access to all the recorded information as well. Is today's session also recorded? Yes. Yep. And we'll post this. We might just post this free on our website somewhere, yeah, Jenny. We'll figure it out. Well, you guys will definitely get the recording. Um, but yeah, that'll be sent out probably tomorrow because it'll have to process. But yeah, we'll get it posted. OK, and I'm also going to include all these slides. So we didn't get to choose our own adventure. I chose for you. Sorry, guys. I thought the breakout rooms would be helpful to meet people. Um, but there is a lot of other information here that I didn't touch on related to um, the energy model calculations and tools, case studies, and monitor data. If you want to look at it, absolutely feel free. There's, It's almost half the slides left and some other resources. And I'm also going to send you guys um, some resources based on what we touched on today. So we can start to help you guys integrate this into your, your practice. Sorry, I keep looking over here. I keep, my camera's over there. So I'm looking at you guys. OK, so thank you all. And thanks for sticking around a little late. Appreciate it. All right, bye.